welcome to the Revelation Per Minute Broadcast, ladies and gentlemen. We were just enjoying a little Christian music there on the Christian United Broadcasting Network and the Cuban.tk. Oh, caught it. RadioPreacherMan.tk is another site that you may frequent. Mm -hmm. But we are glad to have you all here tonight. Uh Uh-huh, C-U-B-N. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but we call it Cuban sometimes for slang or for short. But anyway, God is good all the time. Mm -hmm. We got two guests lined up tonight, one in the first hour and one in the second hour. As always, Brad Olson is planning to be with us in the first hour, I believe. Although, I'm not 100% sure if my wife has, you know corresponded with him to that degree that he was able. I saw something in an email where he said the 16th or 18th he was good for. So, Troy will let me know when he gets here, I'm sure, if he's coming on tonight. But um, I'll go ahead and give a little bio on old Brad, though. He is an award-winning author and a creator of World Stompers in the Sacred Places book series. And this uh, series announces the release of the first installment of a thought-provoking new series, Future Esoteric, The Unseen Realms. Amen. And that's set to debut last December 21st on 2012. Interesting date, and I think that was chosen on purpose, folks, as that was the the ending date for the Mayan calendar. And then uh, the second book in his series is... in the esoteric series is Modern Esoteric Beyond Our Senses, which is due out this December 21st, about a year later. So, uh, interesting stuff. We'll see what happens if he, uh, if he gets through tonight or not. But um, uh, he's, he's published through uh, CCC Publishing, Consortium of Collective Consciousness Publishing, out in Frisco and Cali. So, um, the brothers uh, got a lot going on there in, in the cosmos and such, it looks like. So, we will have an interesting talk uh, when he calls in. And um, also, in the second hour, we're going to have a guest who's going to be with us, Mike McDaniels. And uh, he is... Uh, either with Aaron Jenkins or he's representing Aaron Jenkins from AaronJenkins.com. And they will be joining us in the second hour. And uh, so that's going to be also interesting. Aaron was on before on our show some time ago. Uh, Dr. Jenkins is an author also, a biblical archaeologist and speaker with a passion for apologetics. So... Uh, a God-fearing man. And I tell you what, it's wonderful when people mix archaeology and Christianity. It tends to be a wonderful thing. Now, in the meantime, we have to think about some of these prophecies that have been fulfilled or that are yet to be fulfilled. And um, we know that Jesus, our Messiah, uh, it was it was predicted that he would suffer for the sins of others, and that was predicted in Isaiah 53, which was 2,700 years ago. It's thought to be written Isaiah. So, oh, there it is. I've got another Bible over there that I wanted to get, but uh, mm, let a brother sip just a little bit of his coffee here. Amen. We'll just read a little bit of this. It says in Isaiah 53, 4-6 from the King James, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Praise God. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Mm. <laughs> you know the radio preacher, man, his mind getting a little crazy. Because... Uh, It just is sometimes. It's a good thing, though. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Amen. Now, this was written, like I said, back like 2,700 years ago. This is coming out of the book of Isaiah, folks. Now, if this ain't talking about Jesus Christ, then 
I don't know what is. It says, I'm going to read it again. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Now, folks, we quote that when we pray for people. We quote that very scripture. All we like sheep have gone astray. This is coming out of a Keith Green song, too, back in the in the 70s, so <laughs> maybe early 80s, but a long time ago. Keith's been dead for 30, 30 years or more now from a plane accident. But all we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, that's the one thing about the Lord. I heard this too. As his grace is there for us even when we aren't. He's there for us 100% behind us, calling us home. Even when we're not doing the right thing, we can be living for self, if you will. And God still loves us. And he still wants us to come home. I tell you what, David Langford was on a few months ago, and he straight up said, you know, he was being young and dumb and out drinking and doing stupid stuff when he was a kid. And and he had been, you know, raised in church, and he knew better. And do you know, <laughs> do you know that God basically said to him, this is your last chance. Tonight, you either turn back and turn toward me, or I ain't having nothing to do with you. That's the impression he got from God, and he he went for it. You know, he was like, I guess I've had all I'm drinking tonight, boys. I'm out of here. Y'all can finish my round the pool. I'm getting up out of here. Amen. And he did, and and he uh he was uh evidently finding him a good place of repentance which is something I beckon for you to do every night here at the at the Revelation Per Minute broadcast. Amen. But you know, look what God has done with him since then. He's founded and pastored churches several for years, very successfully, and now he's running his um, ministry. Um, oh, it's evading me the, that, uh, the name of it. But he's very busy up there in the Carolinas and taking care of business and and the Lord's business. When you are in the work of the Lord and in the will of the Lord, there's no better place to be, folks, than in that perfect will of God for your life. You may be the only one who can figure it out, where you're supposed to be, when and why and how. Uh, it may not be for another to know. When I was called to the ministry... I did not know into what capacity of ministry I would be. I did have like a little vision of myself in a pulpit preaching the Word of God. But I did not know if I was going to be a singer or a preacher or a teacher or what I was going to be exactly. But here I am. Amen. So I feel like this is where God wants me right now is doing this and doing my hospital chaplaincy and dealing with folks in their time of need, there's a very important uh, ministry, very important ministry. Sometimes people are on their way out, if you know what I mean. They're not going to make it. And they need a brother to talk to them, that they can talk to as well most often. But um, it's exciting to be in the will of God. It really is. It's not a perfect life, but I wouldn't say that any life is perfect. Do you know that no matter what's going on in your life, there's always that little corner that could be better. There's always something that could be just a little a little better. You know, maybe that's your relationship with your son or your daughter or your spouse or your parents or um, maybe it's some problem with a co-worker. There's always room for improvement. But my message has been this week, contentment. We should be content wherewith we are. Uh, our current situation. Okay, Paul the Apostle said, I've learned to be abased and I've learned to abound. And he learned, he'd been very wealthy, had been a Pharisee and raised in, in the Jewish community uh, as well as the Roman kingdom, you know, empire. So he had it going 
on. He studied under Galileo and studied under the, the greatest teachers and was a wealth of knowledge and probably a wealthy man. <sighs> but as I mentioned the other day, he had to give all that up. He was very zealous for the Word of God, for the for the for the for the truth that they had in the Old Testament, for the law, if you will. He was very zealous persecuting the saints of God, the Christian saints. Amen. And he would imprison them and even sometimes to death. And he was ironically on his way to Damascus, which is quite in the news now, as you know. But he was on his way to Damascus when, well, I was going to say when the stuff hit the fan, but I guess it was more like his butt hit the ground kind of thing. He got knocked off of his high horse and couldn't see nothing. Uh, he probably did wet himself and maybe defecate too when God started talking to him, you know, and be like, where he's like, who that and why I can't see? And he's like, I'm Jesus whom I am persecuting. <laughs> you sorry, man. I love you because I love your zeal, but I want you to be on the other team. So he got drafted to the other team. So instead of persecuting Christians, he was out there preaching the word of God and being persecuted, maybe worse than many, uh, over the course of his life. But look at what he accomplished. He wrote great chunks. I should know how much, but uh, it's not coming to me right now, but he wrote a, a great deal of the New Testament by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, folks. So this man was no slouch and no slacker, and God was able to use that man. Amen. I believe God saw the zeal that he had for the law and said, you know, I could use a bloke like that to get my gospel started going around the world. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so we see that um, most Christians do already understand that this, this and, and Isaiah 53 is referencing that uh, the Lord Jesus is prophesying of his coming. And we all know that he, in retrospect, has already fulfilled this promise, this prophecy, if you will. And, uh, well, all through the Bible, there is a need. Hallelujah. Oh, because of fallen man, we've fallen. We've fallen and can't get up. On our own, we can't, but with Jesus, hallelujah, we just need the power of the Holy Spirit. We just need some cleansing from the blood of Jesus Christ. Well, and then we can get up. We're going to get up out of the grave, people. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. One fine morning when this life is over, i fly away. To a place on God's celestial shore, I'm flowery. It's getting country in here too, ain't it? Hey, <laughs> I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away in the morning when I die. Hallelujah, by and by. I'm going to fly away. Oh, thank you, Lord. It ain't long. You all know the next verse. It says, just a few more weary days. Just a few more weary days, Lord. Mm, do not tarry long, Lord, with you coming back for your bride. Hallelujah, because your bride is ready. Oh, put the white robes on your people, Lord. Hallelujah. Let us be looking for you in the clouds and listening for the trump to blow. Oh, hallelujah, let me be, oh my God, righteous in your eyes. Let me see, let you see, please, the blood of Jesus on me. When you see me, don't see no sin, Lord. I pray it cast it away as far as the east is from the west and same for my people in this listening audience lord and those who listen by archives lord bless them and draw them by the power of the holy spirit to the kingdom of god lord those who have not come to know you draw them draw them through an old preacher like myself what i've just done lord knows amen in jesus name amen 
And folks, what I'm doing here tonight, unbeknownst to me, is we're talking about some prophecy, what was written 2,700 years ago. Amen. In the book of Isaiah, 700 years roughly before Jesus ever came to be, it was written that there would be a Messiah who would suffer in the same manner and do the same miracles and live the spotless, sinless life. Hallelujah. Born of a virgin, folks. This is no ordinary man. Jesus held the fullness of the Godhead bodily within him. Amen. He was all God and all man all at the same time. Hallelujah. Can I get a witness? We can't do him justice here. Amen. I'm just a man trying to share with you what I believe and what I can see in this word. Hallelujah. In the scripture. Hallelujah. In my heart and through the experiences that I've had in my lifetime. For decades now, I've served him and I love him more and I need him more than I ever have. I suspect the same is same for you. Whether you are a Christian who served the Lord for many decades, you see the hour. You know your circumstances. And you know that you need the Lord very likely more than ever before. I know, I know, I know. I'm just praying that you all be strengthened tonight. But them that ain't never gave their life to the Lord. Amen. And I don't care. I don't care. It takes the foolishness of preaching sometimes to get it done. And I got people in my life that I'm praying for that somebody else may have to go and reach. Amen. Because I can't reach them. And the same for this show. I may be reaching somebody that that somebody else is praying for, but they can't reach because those people don't want to hear what these people want to say. You see what I'm saying? But they might hear it from a stranger. So I pray for my people that they might hear it from a stranger, those in my family that are not saved. I pray that the Lord would send someone into their path because they might not hear it from me. You know, a prophet is with, with, uh, uh, is not without respect except for in his own home and in his own town. Amen. I'm not saying I'm a prophet. I might be, though. I did have those dreams lately a couple times. Had some crazy dreams, y'all. Ways too tall to talk about. Lord have mercy. And then, <laughs> I better not even talk about that Prince Charles look at chill thing tattooed on my old lady. That's just not right. But, uh, <laughs> it was a dream, thank goodness. But, um, interesting. Mm-hmm. Hope she ain't planning to take the mark of the beast to something. Ha! <laughs> oh dear. Anyway, it's crazy up in here. But um, you see, we see already through the Word of God, through the Old Testament. We read just two verses from Isaiah fifty-three, brothers and sisters, and we can see. Hmm. We can see that this was talking about our Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. Oh, I love the Lord. I feel good tonight in my spirit, brothers and sisters. I, I'm just, uh, I'm feeling good. I feel the presence of the Lord with me as I speak these words. Hallelujah with poor grandma. Amen. Amen. And I'm glad you all are here tonight. Now, I should, during the break, try to log into the chat room. I'm just scared because before I came live on the air, I heard a lot of static and such, and I had to shut down pretty near every website, save for um, I have a connection with Troy, of course, so he can produce the show, and I can converse with him, and he can let me know when the guests are here, and those kind of things. Hey, there's still some coffee in that cup. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we believe that the Lord Jesus came and fulfilled these prophecies spoken of in Isaiah already. But throughout the Word of God, you will recall, even from the time that Adam and Eve ate 
of the apple or fell from grace, however you want to look at that. But from that time, their sin required a bit of a blood sacrifice. God slew an ox and made for them some decent clothing. But also, I believe that there was an offering for the atonement of their sins. Amen. And we have seen that through the Old Testament. They continued the rituals of sacrificing the little lambs and the oxes and, and the many uh, forms and types of, of animals for to bring an offering to the Lord. An atonement in an attempt to bring atonement for their sins, folks. This is a very important concept because what happened when they were killing those animals, when they slew those animals and they pushed those sins forward by the blood of those animals, what they were doing was covering those sins, but it was never a permanent fix until the Messiah. Oh, hallelujah. There was one need of one perfect sacrifice for all of man's sins and it had to be the Lord because no one else was pure enough nobody else could live pure enough he was that spotless lamb you see there's examples of the spotless lamb there's examples of the red heifer who had to be perfect in every way I think uh Bob was on and he said he could have maybe one or maybe two white hairs or gray hairs and they would sometimes even pluck those. <laughs> so um, it needed to be a perfect sacrifice to get these sins covered for the long run, folks. And you know the ramifications of what went down. It's so profound the way that the, the temple veil was rent in two. And I've heard it said that that veil was nothing light. Uh, it was it was very thick velvet. I can't remember how thick. Maybe six inches. I can't remember. I better not say. And uh, But it could not have been torn by man. It took them time to, many men, to even put that uh, temple veil up. And... Um, it happened in the same instant, you know, that Jesus, you know, gave up the ghost and said, it is finished. And then there was an earthquake and the temple veil rent in two. And what that did is opened up for us a way to come into the Holy of Holies. Prior to that time, only the temple priest could go into the Holy of Holies and converse and, and take the sacrificial blood and the ashes of the red heifer and everything like that up into that area. That was not an area that a man could even go in and he had to be perfect. It was only once a year and he better not have no sin in his life. They even had to tie a rope around him and put a cowbell on him and that way if if they heard the bell quit after a while, after maybe 20, 30 minutes, that bell ain't rung at all. They know, man, maybe he quit moving around in there. Maybe he ain't alive no more. You know, uh, this was very, very serious business. And still to this day, it is serious business. But it's much more um, open to us individuals in the kingdom of God. We can go into Bible says we can come boldly to the throne of God and bring our petitions to the Lord. We don't need a middleman or a priest any longer. Um, and the Jews, well, most of them, well, I say most because I believe it's still the majority of them, have not accepted that Jesus was the Messiah. And so, I, I I often wonder why they don't still have to offer the animal sacrifice. Hmm. Yes, it really makes the brother led to wonder, but nevertheless, um, 
I heard it said. One of my guests explained why they don't have to anymore, and I can't remember his explanation. That's troubling. Maybe it'll come to me. But, um... Mm, hallelujah. When Jesus died on the cross, folks, and I'm not trying to be melodramatic here, I'm just feeling, I'm feeling something here. Um, he didn't have to do any of that, take that beating or be hung on the cross for us. He did it because he loved us. He did it out of love, amen? So, what I was saying, though, is that this is a consistent theme through the Bible. If there is sin, there has to be an atonement for the sin. And I believe even from this day, we should repent if we sin against the Lord. Because um, even though we're saved, I'm speaking to those who are saved, it's, it's still, I think, um, wise to make it sure that anything you've done against the Lord is up under the blood. Amen. I'm talking to myself as well as anybody else because I, I don't live a perfect life. I try to, but I'm still mostly human. Okay. According to my DNA. And uh, I'm going to make a mistake once in a while and say something I shouldn't or, Look somewhere I shouldn't, not not in porn or nothing, but even just driving down the street and you see a pretty girl or something, you look longer than you should or whatnot. And, uh, I mean, these things are bound to happen in the life of a person. But you don't have to dwell on these things. You can ask God to forgive you and get on with doing better tomorrow than you did today. And that's what I often pray in the morning is, Lord, help me to be more like you than I was yesterday. Amen. And a little bit less like old Brian. It's called crucifying the flesh. Amen. Amen. Now, it's something that Paul talked about doing, and it's it's very important. And there's a lot of references to living in a state of rev, uh, righteousness. And... uh this this continues all the way through the book of Revelation. You know that. And sin is is a separator, folks. Sin will keep you from God. It will keep you. There's an old saying that sin will keep you from the Bible, and the Bible will keep you from sin. You've probably heard that. And uh, it's best. The more you can hide the Word of God in your heart, the better off you're going to be against the temptation of the devil. And, uh, well, let's read a little bit from Isaiah 59 and verse 2. It says, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So, folks, sin can separate you from God. Um, hopefully not permanently. I mean, there's a lot of talk about grace and saved by grace. And, you know, I, I'm not trying to to take any credit for our salvation in any way. But um, I'm just reading what the Word says. Your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So you do risk not having your prayers heard if you've got sin in your heart. I think that's a fair assumption based on Isaiah 59 and 2. And we are just about at a um, 6.30 mark, folks. So we're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back in a few moments. God bless each one. Mm-hmm. Okay, that was a short break. <laughs> but I didn't hear any music, so I'm assuming that maybe Troy has stepped away. So we will roll through. We will roll through. Amen. And we will roll through, and we were going to go ahead and talk. And you can flip up into the book of Rome.
day tears were falling I know you saw me hiding there in my bedroom So alone, I was doing my best Trying to be strong, no one to turn to That's when I met Gentlemen, revelations per minute. Mm-hmm. On the radio, preacher man. All right. And now we see in uh, verse well, nineteen, chapter three, book of Romans. Turn with me, folks, to the book of Romans in the New Testament, and we'll see a little bit about this situation. We're talking about grace and and the and the things here. We oh, hallelujah! Now we know. That what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped. And all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Did you hear that, folks? For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Hallelujah. Therefore, verse 20 says, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's an important concept. The law had to be established to make folk aware but I think people do also kind of know when they're doing wrong by natural divine, uh, divine, uh, <sighs> divine revelation. Thank you. I know we learned about that in school. Amen. It's something in known, uh, ingrained in man that they know that they's right and wrong, you know. Um, the pygmies in the jungle, as I've often said, know when they're doing something wrong against God. Amen. But then, well, God gave the law to Moses and to the Jewish people so that they could know for sure when they was wrong. <laughs> ha! Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, but then, the law... Let us know what is sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. That's verse 21. And again, we're in Romans 3. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yes, verse 23 again. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No man has lived perfect and righteous except for Jesus Christ himself. As I mentioned in the first half. He was that spotless lamb required to cover the sins of mankind. Oh, hallelujah now. They could sacrifice a lamb every day. And it wouldn't do what Jesus did. Amen. We needed that perfect sacrifice. And we got it in Jesus Christ. Amen. And I pray that if you're listening tonight, that something I say or something the Word of God points out will cause you to be strengthened and to understand more fully the Word of God and who the Lord is. Amen. And that and that we ain't playing here. This is serious business. Turn with me to Romans six and we'll look at chapter six and verse twenty three, folks. Well let's go back a few more. Let's go back a few more verses. Oh yes, let's keep going back. Oh my Oh yes. 
sin, verse 14, hath not dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. So there's grace coming into play, folks. We are saved by grace. I don't challenge that. I'm just saying we should do our best to please the Lord once we are saved by grace. I don't think we can continue. As Paul's getting ready to say, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey? His servants ye are to whom ye obey. Whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. I think that's pretty uh, pretty amazing right there. Whether you yield, amen, to sin, and which leads unto death, or, or you yield to obedience, which leads to righteousness. See the connection there in 16? Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey his servants ye are, to whom ye obey? You see, this is a decision you make by your actions, folks. Amen. Whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness, by being obedient to the Lord, we become righteous. I mean, it's just a side effect. It's just going to happen. As you continue to submit to the authority of the Lord, you will become more righteous over the period of your life. And I believe wholeheartedly that's God's will for each of us. That's His real will. I mean, there are other little wills and perfect wills and things but the main goal is that we mature. Because Paul even talks at some point here in the Word about, I don't know exactly where it is, about coming off of the milk and eating bread. You know, you get to an age like a newborn baby drinks a lot of milk. and Now, nowadays, formula. But historically, a newborn baby would drink a lot of milk. And then eventually they would grow some teeth and start gumming them Cheerios or bread or whatever. They would go to the bread, you know. And uh, as men and women of God, we should be maturing in our walk with the Lord so that we can take the bread and not only get our nourishment from the milk, you know, the basic stories of the Bible or whatever, or that little bit you get on Sunday or whatever. You need to be in the Word of God. Those folks that are joining this broadcast are oftentimes, this is an extra hour or two that they will spend pursuing that perfect will of God outside of church. And it's hard to get all you need in an hour, hour and a half service, you know, for a whole week, folks. So keep that in mind. But God be thanked, verse 17 says, that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Do you see, there it is again, that connection. We're made free from sin by the grace, yes. But then we become the servants of righteousness. I think if you have truly been redeemed from those sins, you're going to want to do better in your life and to live more like Jesus would live if he were here in 2013. God helped the world if he was. Mm -hmm. I mean, here in the flesh, you think he did bad by them money changers driving him out with the whip. What would he do today? <laughs> a sinful man. Amen. But God, it says in 17, be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. See, we were all servants of sin at one time prior to our salvation, even if you were a eight-year-old child. You know, when you got saved, I'll bet you probably had some sin in your nature prior to that. Okay? And hopefully not so much after that. But I think that naming the name of Christ makes you conscious of your decisions and your 
how you're representing the Lord. If you truly know the Lord, then you are aware, no matter what your condition or circumstances, even as I mentioned in the first hour, a friend who was in a bar drunk, you know, drinking and and drunk. <laughs> and uh, God spoke to him in his mind or in his heart or maybe audibly. I don't recollect the story, but he said, this is the last day that I'm going to be patient with you or that I'm going to pursue you. You either make up your mind to serve me now or I'm not going to have nothing to do with you anymore. Now, my my personal thing is if that ever happened to me, I would do exactly what David did and I would be scared to death or pert near because your soul hangs in the balance. Well, you don't want to you don't want to get to the beam of seat judgment and be found lacking. You don't want the Lord to say, "Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you." This is a uh, this is the day we live in, folks, and you need to be aware. that this is not a time to be dilly-dallying and dabbling in sin. The trump could blow at any time. We could be at the at the marriage supper of the Lamb. But God, it said in 17, be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. You were the servants of sin. We all were, as I mentioned. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men, because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness. Unto holiness. Hmm. Righteousness unto holiness. Yield your members. Wow. I believe that's talking about. And Paul furthers in another place. He says that we should be able to contain our own vessel. Each man and each woman should be able to contain your vessel. And I think that these are ramifications and implications that sexual promiscuity is something that we have to conquer as Christian believers at some point. And Paul does make it very clear that if you cannot, then you need to get married. For it is better to marry than to burn, implying that if you if you continue, and, and you might just find yourself burning one day in hell, you know? So I, I think this is very serious because of our day that we live in, whereas... It's even in the screens, you know, if you watch a movie or a tele show or whatever, and the sexual promiscuity is rather accepted in our culture, 2013 and all. And, uh, well, I just, I just don't recommend that y'all live that way. I recommend that you uh, not take and play games with your soul. Amen. I was talking to somebody today. I'm 90% sure it was today. Not at all sure who it was. And they said... Well, I'm not sure what they said. <laughs> I'm not sure. At this point, I'm not sure where I was going with that. Um... I do want to get to verse 23 before we run out of time, so let's see where we're at. Um, we're, we're at 17. We're going into 18. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the iniquity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. 
For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. Is that right? Yes, when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. You didn't have that burden. You notice how some people who are sinners and and just living for self and whatnot, they just don't have to have that burden, as it says here, of righteousness. They don't have to think about it or try to attain it or um, because they're not saved, you know. But once they get saved, you know, things start changing. Your whole viewpoint is going to change. And you're going to start thinking Christ-like thoughts and you're going to start thinking, okay, I can't do that anymore. I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't speak this way or act this way. or Yada, yada, you know what I'm saying. But you're free from that. And then... Before that, now I'm not trying to discourage anybody from getting saved. If you're on the fence, go ahead and jump onto the side of being saved, amen. But, <laughs> but I'm just saying that, well, it's often said that when when sinners act poorly, it's because they're sinners. And sinners sin, you know. It's just kind of what they do. Um, so what uh, fruit had ye then, verse 21 says, what fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Wow. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. And here we go with 23. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, praise Jesus. I'm trying to get the phone number for the show up here. Honey, I'm on the show here. People can hear you. A, B, C, D, F, G, H. <laughs> Okay, folks, if you're interested to call in tonight, I will display the number 661-449-9924. Uh, 661-449-9924. But look at this. I'm telling you, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, folks, I would say we need to turn from sin if the wages of sin is death. This is this is common common sense here to say the least. Now in the second hour we are to have our guest arriving in about six or eight minutes and this guest is going to be Michael. Mm -hmm, yes. Mike McDaniels from AaronJudkins.com. Now, we'll discuss some of that when he comes on. Aaron's been on the show before, and uh, but Michael is filling in for him tonight uh, during this broadcast. Amen. Now, look at verse 1 of chapter 7 while we're here. Paul continues. He says, Know ye not, brethren, where I speak to them that know the law. See, he was a Jewish man. He was speaking to the Jewish peoples. Uh, I read the other day that the first eight years that the Christian church was around, it was all Jews. And um, I think for most of the next ten years after that, it was pretty much primarily Jews that made up the church. So it took a while to reach the Gentiles. You know, they didn't have cars and things to get around. But, um... And at first, they weren't even sure the Gentiles could share in this. You remember that Cornelius was uh, the first recorded salvation of a Gentile believer. Amen. Now know ye not, brethren, 7 and 1 in Romans says, For I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband, so long as he lives. But if the husband is dead, why, she is loosed from the law of a husband. So then if, 
while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Hmm. So there is the key to that freedom, folks. I mean, yes, we're saved by grace, and we try to live righteous, but there are some things that are within our control, and that is uh, marriage and divorce. And a woman should not get divorced and then marry another bloke, as we'll see, because he will be into a, a fornication relationship, uh, maybe as a, as a third party but if this woman was married to another bloke, then she's not to marry again unless she's reconciled to that bloke that she was married to before, as you'll see. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that he should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Hmm, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. How about them apples? But sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of conspicuousness. Did you know Paul was English? Because when I read his writings, I sound a bit English, so he must have been. Ha! But uh, for, for without the law, sin was dead. Amen. Without the law, sin was dead. And because of the law, sin leads to death. How ironic is that? Kind of backwards. But there you have it, folks. The law didn't deliver it. And the law came and let us know what is sin. Amen. As we saw uh, in verse 7. Mm -hmm. There it is. Let not sin therefore reign likewise reckon ye for any. Mm -hmm. Now, okay. One of them verses we read. It justified. It said that the law has revealed the sin. Essentially, we are aware of our sin because of the law that God gave to Moses. But then right here, in the bottom of chapter 7 and verse 8, it says, For without the law, sin was dead. Mmm. But apparently with the law, sin is alive and well for the time being because sin does lead to death. Mm-hmm. For I was alive without the law once. Amen. That goes back to what I said earlier about sinners going to sin. They don't care about righteousness, you know, so much because they don't, that's not in the forefront of their mind. When you get saved, you start thinking about these things. You start thinking, I got to rep the Lord. I got to, I got to walk right, walk to walk, talk to talk. Praise Jesus, for I was alive without the law once, Paul says. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. His flesh died, you know, he died to self. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. Dang, where? For the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. So we are at the top of the hour. And uh, I don't know, I'm going to say, Troy, let a brother know when another brother calls in what he's supposed to call in the second hour. So I will type this. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, 
I suppose we'll take a short break and get a cup of joe, and we'll come back ready for the hour number two, Revelations per minute. Hang tight. is made every day I choose my fate to go another hour. Hallelujah. Amen. Tonight we have Mike McDaniel with us, and he's representing AaronJudkins.com. Now, whether Aaron Judkins is going to be with us or not, I'm not 100% sure. But uh, either way, Michael is going to be here. 
and we're going to discuss some things that are going on here. And Dr. Judkins, as you know, I mentioned in the first hour, is an author and biblical archaeologist and speaker with a passion for apologetics, folks. And he is credited with mapping the longest contiguous dinosaur trackway in the western hemisphere near Glen Rose, Texas, back in the year 2000. So uh, that same year, Dr. Judkins discovered a new theropod dinosaur trail in the Paluxy River named, in his honor, the Judkins Trail. Interesting how many folks have the, a, a trail for dinosaurs named after you. <laughs> <laughs> That's all good, I reckon so. Now, he has participated also in numerous excavations throughout the U.S. and Israel. So, including the Pool of Siloam in Jerusalem in 2004. So, Dr. Judkins has been around. He's been featured on TBN. Um, he's been uh, very well received in many circles. And um, we're going to get on with, I think, Mike, is that you tonight? Is this Mike McDaniels with us? Uh, yes, sir. And is Dr. Jenkins? I'm here. Oh. Okay. Okay, Dr. Jenkins is here as well. All right. Now, the last time we were uh, discussing some of these things about UFOs, and uh, I guess you're a bit of a ufologist and a dinosaurologist as well. Hey, is that a word? <laughs> or did I just make a new one? Well, I think I think you just made a new one up, but that's okay. Uh, I think I think people would understand what that would mean. Yeah, I think that's a cool word, a dinosaurologist. That's all right. Um, <laughs> that's good. That's good. Um, we were talking, yeah, about alien abductions and different things that uh, that are often discussed on this broadcast. And um, now you've written several books as well. Um, Dividing the Word and Keys to the Kingdom. So these are interesting uh, book titles. Alien Agenda, of course, being the most popular, I would think. Uh, now, uh, what about the Foundation for Faith, Academic Freedom, Exposing Evolution, and Evolution and Human Fossil Footprints? So you're a bit of an archaeologist now. How did you get interested in archaeology there, uh, Dr. Jackson? Well, uh, for me, it started out when when I was young. I used to go out with my grandparents, and, you know, they were old rock hounds. And that kind of caught my attention early on. You know, I always liked to go out and explore. When I was about 15 years old, I, I was out playing in a creek one day, and I stumbled across um, a giant bison bone. Now, the bisons are the buffaloes of the American Southwest, and and uh, there was a high cliff, probably 12 feet uh, above my head. And the person I was with said, well, I said, hey, look what I found. I found this huge bone. And they said, well, um, I was 15. And, and they said, well, my dad said that this is where the Indians ran the buffaloes off the cliff to kill them. And so um, I thought, well, that's kind of neat, you know. And, and I always was interested in finding rocks and arrowheads and fossils and and so I looked right up, and at eye level, looking into the cliff was part of an occipital skull. That's the back part of the of the human skull. Mm-hmm. And I saw it. It's right at my eye level. I saw it, and I saw the suture lines in the skull, and I knew immediately that was a human skull. I said, "Hey, let's let's dig it out." <laughs> you know, being being a kid, I was searching for the nearest stick. You know, to to dig that thing out. And, yeah. You know. I heard that no, let's let's uh, let's go tell my dad. And I heard dad was uh, a ranch uh, foreman uh, for a for a ranch, and and so we went and, and told him. It turns out I didn't find this out till years later, but it turns out that uh, I had incidentally discovered um, an Indian burial ground, and and one of the. Um, Local universities came out along with the, the Native Americans, and they identified it. And, of course, the Native Americans have priority over their sites, and so um, they were able to document it and and recognize it. Uh, so so that was pretty interesting. But 
and I had a, a long-standing interest in history and archaeology since I was young. Oh, well, that's, that's interesting. Now, Michael McDaniel is with us as well, Dr. Judkins, and I'm glad you brought him along. And I accidentally gave uh, you credit for his books, Rightly Dividing the Word and Keys to the Kingdom, are actually Michael McDaniel's books. And uh, so I apologize to you, Michael, for that. And uh, oh, you are okay. the... Yeah, you're the president of the Millennium Bible Institute and pastor of the Bible Fellowship Church in Monahans, Texas. Now, I must inquire then, uh, do you, the Millennium Bible Institute, I feel like I've heard tell of that, and I know, um, is that a fairly popular uh, Bible school there in Texas? Well, um, we have... um I, I don't know. Let, I, I can tell you a little bit about it. I'm not sure how popular we are. Um, there's um, there's two ways that folks a- access the materials from Millennium Bible Institute. First of all, we hold classes uh, out here in West Texas, and then we also hold classes up in North Texas uh, on Sundays out in West Texas and on Tuesdays up in North Texas. It's in the Glen Rose area, uh, just out of Fort Worth. And um, we've, uh, you know, we've uh, graduated some folks through the uh, through the programs that we've made available. But probably uh, there's far more people that actually follow us along online or order the DVDs for those classes. Um, we've got folks that are involved in our studies in 43 foreign countries, and I'm not sure how many states, pretty close to all of them. There may be a couple of them we don't have anybody following along with, but um, there's quite a number that actually follow us along. We we post a lot of stuff on our website. It's um, graceage.org, and uh, folks are able to go over and avail themselves. There's probably a couple of hundred hours of uh uh, of, uh, sessions that we've done that we just make available for folks over there, and you know we're adding to it all the time. But uh, what we tried to do is we tried to just take folks that have an interest in the Bible and give them a real solid foundation and in, uh, in understanding the Bible. And so mm-hmm. we've done that in, in levels that kind of increase a little bit as as they continue on. And um, and and so we're real happy to be able to do that. Uh, and it's uh, and by the way, thanks for having us on your program. We really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. I'm glad to have you because I I think I knew somebody who was um, taking some correspondence courses at one time. It seemed like they had mentioned the Millennium Bible Institute to me uh, a year or so hmm. ago. And, and uh, but that's awesome. You cover the book of the Bible in depth, I suppose, uh, versus versus some of, the, some of the theology that you get in, in, in uh, seminary and stuff. It's more uh, theories and things and a lot of books about uh, the Bible versus studying the actual Bible itself, Michael. And so that's kind of cool that uh, there's a place for folks to go to to actually delve deeper into the Word of God at great age. Well, thanks. And do they have to uh, study a certain course and obtain a degree, or do you just kind of pick and choose what you want? Well, there are. If uh, if someone is going to graduate, um, there are courses that are prescribed within each one of those certificate uh, completion uh, courses. Um, you know, we do uh, we do a basic overview of. Um, uh, the things about the dispensation of grace, and, and there's 15 courses that are that are in there, um, and and folks can do that and graduate from that course of study. Uh, we have another one that is um, uh, our School of Biblical Studies, and uh, that actually gets folks educated in God's program with the nation of Israel and um, gets them acquainted. It, it kind of starts them out in the Old Testament and then runs through. Uh, the books of Hebrews to Revelation, um, you, you know, at the end of that course of study. And there's a, a, a certificate awarded to folks that actually... Pe- now, if you enroll in the Bible Institute, there is a final exam, and folks have to take that to be able to graduate. Uh, our last graduation was uh, was a couple of years ago, actually about three years ago, and we graduated about 180 folks in cap and gown ceremonies. And so it's always exciting to do that, but, um, but you know, it takes a little while to 
you know, get folks back to a place where they're ready to complete another course of study. We've done things on the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel. And then most recently, we've been doing some studies in the book of Romans. Those are the things that we posted on the website. Uh, first five chapters of the book of Romans deals with justification. And uh, we've got about 44 hours posted on the website in both video and MP3 form, uh, audio formats. So folks can either watch the videos or download the MP3s and listen. And then in uh, chapters, Romans chapter 6, 7, and the first 13 verses of chapter 8, we've got another 46 hours on sanctification. And then starting in Romans eight fourteen and moving through the rest of the chapter, well, actually running through the next two verses is where you're told the third component of your sanctification, and which is critical to know, and so we've got 122 hours on that. And uh, that's all verse by verse and word word for word. And, um, you know, I think it's one of the most exciting things that we've ever done. And um, we're, just, we're just, you know, tickled to death that our Heavenly Father has uh, included us and, and, and done for us in Jesus Christ all the things that he has. And by the way, I'll just mention one other thing if I can. There's another book that I've got coming out at the end of the month called Judging Angels. Uh, when the Apostle Paul says in the book of 1 Corinthians, no, you're not, we shall judge angels, um, you know, he's not talking about, you know, judging bad angels like some kind of courtroom where you bang the gavel and pronounce somebody guilty or anything like that. Uh, he's actually talking about um, what we're going to be doing in eternity. And uh, as we involve ourselves in our Heavenly Father's business, uh, we're going to be putting into use four godly, judgmental skills that we will have been educated in uh, from Romans chapter 12 to Romans chapter 16, and we'll be utilizing those in our Heavenly Father's business in eternity, and part of that will involve our um, having administration over the angels, and I'm talking about the good angels, and uh, there's some things that we're going to be doing, and I'm really excited about that book coming out because it just seems like for folks that are uh, counting on going to heaven, we know very, it seems like, it, it, coming up for me anyway, I, I just never really heard anybody talk much about what we're going to be doing. And so uh, a lot of misconceptions about, you know, what that's going to involve. So I'm kind of okay. anxious for this to get out there and for folks to understand there really is a job that we're going to be involved in and what you'll do to qualify for that job. Not everybody's going to be doing the same thing and, uh, but it is going to involve angels, and um, and we're going to be involved in something pretty magnificent. And um, so, anyway, I just thought I'd throw that out there. Sure. And that's coming out. You said this month. Yeah, by the end of the month, it's uh, it's at the editors, and they're correcting all my bad grammar and punctuation. And so we're uh, we're hoping to get that to the publisher uh, right at the end of the month. Okay, and that'll be available at graceage.org as well? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Well, all right. That's all good. And uh, Dr. Judkins, where can we find your books? If people in the listening audience want to get a hold of some of your books, where should they go to get uh, the books that you've written? Well, I'll give you, uh, for the newest book, Alien Agenda, The Return of the Nephilim, of course, that is a book that Dr. McDaniel and I co-authored, refuting the cosmic evolutionary theory and some of the ancient alien theory, the ancient astronaut theory that's out there. And so you can go to uh, alien-agenda.com. That's alien-agenda.com. And if you want to find, uh, that'll put you to, to the book website for Alien Agenda. Then if you wanted just to go and see what, other things that I have done, you can follow me on my personal website, and that's AaronJudkins.com. It's A A R O N J U D K I M S. AaronJudkins.com, and I'm linked up there to all the social media um, to the to my bookstore, so people can go there um, and and follow us. By the way, Dr. McDaniel um, uh, has added. Uh, uh, another school on to the program there at Millennium Bible Institute called the School of Biblical Archaeology. And wow. um, we 
we've developed a crash course in biblical archaeology for folks who are interested in that. And if they go to uh, graceage.org, and we have a, another website that's rather new to the to the school, and that's mbistudies.com, mbistudies.com. And people can go and just check out the course, the crash course in biblical archaeology, and we have a special going on for that. Um, you get two DVDs uh, for the classroom. Um, you have uh, 200 pages of notes that come along with that, and, and then a, a, a book by Dr. Clifford Wilson. And that course is, we're running that for a flat fee of $200 even for the course. And so people can can uh, to go to MBI Studies or, or great, uh, .com or go to um, uh, my website, ericjackins.com, and uh, sign up for that crash course in biblical archaeology. We cover the Old Testament uh, specifically, so the archaeology of Assyria, the archaeology of Persia, the archaeology of Babylon, the archaeology of Egypt, and the archaeology of Israel. So if you wanted to know something about archaeology in the Old Testament, this course is designed for you. You can take it at your own pace. And then at the end, if you want a, want a certificate, we have a certificate program that if you sign up for that uh, and you want to graduate with your certificate in biblical archaeology, then contact uh, Millennium Bible Institute and they'll get you signed up for that. It's it's one of our um, most recent um, schools that we have developed and and uh, up and coming. So I think I think uh, people are really interested in knowing about some of those artifacts and where they came from and how they link up and show the historicity of the Bible, because there are many artifacts that are extra biblical that are found outside the realms of the Bible that in, do indeed confirm the veracity of the Bible. And so this is really important if you're sharing your faith with your family or friends, and they like history or archaeology or artifacts. This is a course to be able to go through, and then, of course, the 200 pages of notes you can follow along through the course, and, and you have all that right at your fingertips and your disposal for your reference at whatever whatever time you want to. So it's a, it's one of those uh, new courses that we have uh, at the School of uh, Millennium Bible Institute. Wow, well, that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, that's very interesting, in fact, gentlemen, because, um, well, I was just speaking a little bit in the first half about how we have to pray that people can be reached. I mean, it's hard sometimes to prove the Bible is the Word of God, you know? Uh, sometimes people have a hard time even accepting that. So how do you witness to somebody? So you're kind of laying the foundation of proving the validity of the Bible, in a sense, through archaeology. And I think that's uh, that's excellent, you know, because well, there are... It's the Book of Jasher and different things that are out there, yeah. too. And uh, Well, when people go through the, any of the courses, the schools here at Millennium Bible Institute, whether it's the School of Biblical Studies or the School of Theology or the School of Eschatology, any one of these schools that they offer, um, you get a foundational level of understanding that you're building on that as you go through your, your studies. And it's when 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 Dr. McDaniel wrote that book, rightly dividing the word. Um, I actually read that book before it came out when he had it in, you know, just in the, a thesis format, and and he did a study on that. And I was I was at that study, and and you know that really changed um, how I studied the Bible. Rightly dividing the word is so important. Um, and people really just don't know how to study it. But through these courses, you understand that uh, they take you through these courses, and you're able to see uh, the Bible come alive. And it's just the, um, the the applications to the Bible are so important on how to rightly divide the word. And once you understand that, um, it, it really opens up a whole new level of understanding on how that is laid out because it's, you know, we don't go and get doctrine out of the book of, you know, uh, Deuteronomy or Leviticus anymore. Um, 
but you know, you 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 know, if some some people go and get doctrines from other places in the Bible and try to build a you know whole doctrine around that, and and there's a specific layout um, that the Apostle Paul teaches us. Um, Mike, uh, Dr. McDaniel's doing a great study now on sonship, and that's part of that that study in Romans that he was talking about a while ago, and that sonship that Paul talks about in Romans is, is really critical to building um, our, our Christian walk. It, it talks about the edification and the sanctification, and you go through all, through all the um, uh, education that Paul lines out for you in your Christian walk, and once you get these down, you understand fully your sonship in Christ. It's it's probably one of the most important things a Christian can really understand and go through and, and, and learn about your rights and privileges as a son. And, and once you go through that at the School of um, uh, the Millennium Bible Institute, uh, you will really uh, have a just a foundational understanding of the Word of God like you would never have before. And, and that will really open up your understanding for people. And so that is... Hey, um, is it... I was going to say, right. is it okay for me to throw something here? Sure. sure. Um, you, you were mentioning something. I'm really glad that, that Aaron brought up that school of archaeology because, you know, that's really written where you don't have to be... Um, you know, you don't have to be familiar with all the trade language to, to be able to benefit from that course. But when you were saying a while ago that, you know, there's an objection that people have to the Bible being the Word of God and how do you witness to folks, uh, the only thing I wanted to add to that was uh, we actually do make some materials available. We covered it in, the, in, our, in, in that, that study in the Book of Romans and Justification, but there is actually a separate study that we did where the Apostle Paul, early on in the book of Romans, talks about the, the, the categories of excuses that people give when we witness uh, the excuses they give for not receiving Jesus as their Savior. You know, yeah. it, a lot of people are uncertain about how to witness because they're afraid some guy's going to introduce some kind of objection, you know, based on some evolution or, uh, you know, and maybe they don't feel knowledgeable enough to be able to feel like they could refute all of those things. And and people, you know, think that they've got to get, you know, uh, got to get smart about a bunch of different subjects so they can actually answer all the objections. Actually, yes. the Scripture has already categorized every single objection you will ever hear and given you the response for it. There's no need for you to become an expert in a dozen different fields. But in those located in those first five chapters of the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul lays out every objection that, it, that you will ever hear in your life, and he gives you the very response that you're supposed to give them out of the Word because the power to change a person is resident in the Word of God. That's, that's the power of that Word to effectually work in the soul of a man. And those words are designed to do just that. Um, and so if folks are interested in that, uh, they could contact us, and we'd be glad to make... I mean, that, that is available in a little separate study. They don't, they don't have to, you know, get all five chapters of the Book of Romans, but if there's some folks out there that would really like to, to have that kind of information to be able to know that no matter what someone said to them when they were witnessing to them, that they would know exactly what to do. And as a matter of fact, this, this actually comes with a set of tracks so that these tracks are geared to meet all those different objections. So if someone were to come along and say, well, I, I'm not sure there's a God, well, then we've got a track that's just for that, and it comes right out of the Scripture and it addresses that issue uh, if someone comes along and says, well, I, you know, I don't really believe that God's going to send anybody to hell. Well, we've got a tract that addresses that. And as you go through all these excuses, um, you know, the Bible has the answer to every bit of that. And so this, this program that has been developed actually just lumps all this together, and, and we can send out the, 
you know, there's a booklet that explains how to use all of this and, and, and how it all goes. And then those tracks, when someone runs into someone that's got some kind of an objection, then they just give them the track, you know, because they may think, well, what all do I need to say to them? Well, it, it's really it's really not as much about what we say to them as it is about what the Bible says to them. And this yeah. track will point them right back at the Scripture, and that Scripture is meant to actually cause them to understand the truth of what God has declared in His Word. And so um, I just wanted to tell folks about that because that's, you know, I learned early on the Roman road, and, you know, and I, I've used that to win a lot of people to Christ. But I have to tell you that sometimes you run into objections about things you don't know how to handle, and, and really... Uh, it's it's the word of God. It's that that's sharper than a two edged sword that has the ability to uh, divide asunder soul and spirit and bring a man to the truth. And and so um, anyway, I just wanted to tell folks that we certainly make that available and uh, like to equip people to be able to uh, have confidence as they witness to folks for Christ. Yes, and I'm, I'm grateful to have you guys, gentlemen, tonight because. During the first hour, I was teaching, and I actually got into the Book of Romans. Now, I haven't been through your course yet, but I, I was in Romans 3 and Romans 6, talking about how the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, and how that the law came about to establish sin, so we know when we were sinning against God. So, it's just the way God works many, many times, the first hour and the second will complement each other. Um, I had no idea we were going to be in this discussion about the justification and sanctification and and uh, all this through the Book of Romans. So this is interesting that we're having this conversation. But uh, it's true, though. The Word of God, you know, it, is going to stand forever. Uh, heaven and earth may pass away. So the better we can learn it, and I said this earlier today, uh, the better we can learn the Word of God and have it hidden in our heart, the stronger, maybe it was yesterday, but the stronger we're going to be when we're faced with a temptation, you know, or when we're faced with persecution, heaven forbid. Uh, we know the Word of God, gentlemen, and so I, I certainly appreciate you for developing this course, uh, the school, and, and these several courses. That's, that's great. Well, and I'm sure. Thanks, Th and thanks for the opportunity to let us uh, uh, talk about that a little bit. We're we're, we're really grateful. Yes, now, the Alien Agenda book is out now, right? The Alien Agenda: The Return of the Nephilim. That's the new book that you're out with. I know we started to discuss it the last time you fellows were on uh, my show, and we didn't get that far through it uh, because it's so in depth. So perhaps uh, we'll we'll try to brief people a little bit about that book as well while well, got you here tonight um, the subtitle of the book mentions the Nephilim now what can you tell us about them and what is your understanding maybe of their connection with UFOs I think we were discussing that the last time you were on hey Aaron why don't you why don't you field that one well when when you're looking when you're looking in the Bible and in you know, when you go across that Genesis 6 uh, passage where it talks about the, the, the giants of old, uh, yeah. the men of renown, well, you know, that is talking about the Hebrew word for, for giants there. The Hebrew word uses the word Nephilim, and it means to fall. And so uh, when, when you see this account in Genesis 6, the Nephilim is the offspring of of the sons of God, those fallen angels, and the daughters of men. Now, the Hebrew uses the term benahe Elohim, which means the sons of God. Now, the sons of God is always a wingless uh, male angel in the Old Testament. Um, when they appear uh, to, 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 you know, to, to Jacob, Jacob wrestled, you know, one of those angels physically, Held on to his leg, you know, wouldn't let him go until he was blessed. Abraham entertained angels. Uh, we see the angels uh, that were that appeared as normal human men that came into the city of, of Sodom and Gomorrah, and, and the men recognized them 
as just normal men. They did not realize they were angels, and the angels blinded them so they could lock his family out. But when we yeah. see the term sons of God used in the Old Testament, it's always referring to angels. But we're not talking about those uh, heavenly angels um, that we know of today. Uh, we're, we're talking about those fallen angels that were once part of the heavenly realms, and, and might I add, they still are part of the heavenly realm, uh, but they have fallen, and when they when they rebelled with Lucifer, a third of those angels rebelled, and and uh, oh. over in Jude, it says that they left their first estate, and to, mm-hmm. to, to, uh, uh, that they went after strange flesh. So we see that in the book of Genesis, the Nephilim are the offspring of the sons of God, the fallen angels, and the daughters of men, and the result is this unnatural um, uh, offspring of giants that had six fingers, six toes, 24 digits in all, they had double rows of teeth, and they were huge. Now, if, if you're looking at those, you know, those cubits that are listed in the Bible, a standard cubit could go as much as 18 inches long, and a royal cubit may have been the length of the firstborn son, or that could be the length between, you know, the, the, the elbow and the forefinger, but Typically, the, the general understanding is that it's, that's about 21 inches long. So if you're looking at that, those guys, you know, Goliath would have been between 13 and 15 feet tall. King Og was, was one of the tallest of them. And when we see that, you know, uh, it gives the length of his, you know, of his bed. And, yeah. and, and so we see that these, these giants were huge. Now, some people will say, well, they, well it's, it's the line of Seth and, you know, they're intellectual giants. And we address those criticisms in the book uh, that we really don't have time to get into here. But those Nephilim are those giants that appeared in Genesis 6, and they were doing something uh, because when the children of Israel were commanded to go into Canaan and take the land, guess what they saw? They saw those giants. But we see that... Those giants were before the flood, those Nephilim Mm -hmm. were before the flood, and they were corrupting all flesh on the earth. Now, if you go to some of the apocryphal books, like the Book of Enoch and the Book of Jasher and the Book of Jubilees, really, it's not not canonical. Uh, We we don't take it for Scripture, but there's there's some history that that really fills in on that. And I don't know how much of all that's true. It's interesting that the Book of Enoch, however was found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, so, uh, but it's interesting that some of the history that, that parallels Genesis uh, shows that these, these giants were corrupting all flesh and that everything in the earth was being corrupted by this thing. Um, and that when you have a corruption of the human DNA line, well, the Son of God um, can't be born um, to, to redeem mankind. And so... We see that these giants were were corrupting all flesh, and before the flood, God wipes them out in the flood, and He tells Noah to build a boat, and him and 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 uh, um, and his family were saved, eight people total, and these were the ones who were not. Uh, it says that the Bible says that there um, he was per- that Noah was perfect in his generations. It doesn't mean that he was a perfect man. It means that he had an unpolluted, uncorrupted genetic gene line um, that he could populate, repopulate the earth afterwards because of all this that was going on. And then they show up after the flood. Uh, you see them in Numbers 13:33, the sons of Anak, and then you see the Rephraim, uh, Goliath, and his four brothers. You know, when when David picked up that stone out of the river, he picked up five stones. One for Goliath and four for his brothers. And so we see them fighting off the giants in the land because they were over there occupying the land to keep the children of Israel out of there. And so um, so the Nephilim are, are these giants that we see in uh, before the flood and also after the flood. And it's interesting that some of these giants um, have been found in, in the archaeological and historical uh, um, content uh, throughout, you know, ancient cultures, we see these giants. 
there's been reports of giant remains being found. Matter of fact, there was a, uh, one of, uh, I think it was Murnitaw's um, uh, sarcophagi in Egypt was found, uh-huh. and it was 12 feet long. So, uh, and so we see that it's within the realms of these giants, and even the Egyptians, in their historical writings, feared the, uh, the, the sons of Anak, the Anakims, uh, because these were the Nephilim giants, and they were feared throughout the land. That's amazing. But, uh, I, I believe that there were giants. It's, it's recorded in the Word of God, so... That's not to be uh, debated so much as to, well, there's a lot of folks saying that there will be giants again because of the scripture where it says, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the second coming of the Son of Man. Do you think that that implies that there's going to be giants again? Well, yeah, that's the subtitle of our book, Alien Agenda, The Return of the Nephilim. You know, and, and it... We do think that those Nephilim will return in the last days. Uh, there's a scripture over in Daniel that talks about this, and we outline this and detail it in the book. But it, it talks about that this, that the, you know when you get down to those ten toes of Nebuchadnezzar's statue, um, you know the head of gold is you know Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire, the, the chest and arms of silver, and the Medes and the Persians, the, the belly and the thighs of uh, of the statue were of brass, and that was Alexander the Great. The legs were of iron, and some say they want to call that Rome with the revived Roman Empire. And we differ uh, with people from that. Even though Rome was the next world empire in history, um, uh, people want to use that to say, well, there, you know, in the end times, there's going to be the revived Roman Empire. And, and Dr. McDaniel does a, an excellent job, has an excellent study out on that, and why that... Um, the revived Roman Empire is not it. It, it. it has to do with those nations that surround Israel. But then you get down to the ten toes, which is iron mixed with miry clay. Now, that, yeah. that statue as a representation of the Gentile world empires throughout, the, throughout the history. We're down to, we have not gotten there yet, but we're down to those ten toes. Those ten toes are those we see those ten toes, those ten kings over in Revelation. That's when all that crops up. That's when you're in the ten toes. And that's the end of the Gentile rule. That's it. And and so uh, that's right before Israel's program gets, gets uh, well, that's right in when the Israel program uh, gets relaunched. The, the end of the Gentile rule comes to a halt, and Israel's program is resumed. Um, and then Daniel's 70th week kicks in over there, and, and then you're right smack dab into the book of Revelation. Uh, so those ten toes where it says that iron does not mingle, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, iron does not mix with miry clay, and their seed shall not mix with the seed of men, um, that we're seeing that there's, a, there's a, a strange occurrence that's prophesied that uh, their seed will also not mix just like Iron does not mix with miry clay, so we have to ask, who are they talking about? Well, it, the Bible says, as in the days of Noah and in the days of Lot, we see that in the end times that some of these things will be reoccurring. So this begs the question, as it was in the days of Noah, well, what was going on in the days of Noah and in the days of Lot? Well, we see what's happened back there. Well, is there a repeat of history that's coming about that's going to happen again? And we think the answer is yes, that the Bible does teach that these Nephilim will return because, look, there's an army being geared up for this last uh, attempt, of, uh, one of the last attempts of Satan to usurp the earth from from the Lord. And that's what it's all about. You know, he's, he's trying to get you know, reign in dominion so he can be worshipped. So when this is part of that plan, and look, when you got a kingdom, you got to have, you know, you got to have a hierarchy. You got the, you know, you usually got a a king or you know somebody that rules, and you got the people under them and the subordinates, and you got the warriors. And 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 and, and we see a perfect example of that is is the Lord of the Rings, uh, the movie. Uh, mm-hmm. So you have you have two kingdoms gearing up for warfare. 
And Paul warns us, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities, powers, uh, wickedness, rulers, uh, and uh, in high places. And, and we see that this is a hierarchy, um, that, but now we don't wrestle against these things now because our battle is spiritual. But in, mm-hmm. when you get into the book of Revelation, that will be a physical battle over there, that battle of Armageddon, when the Lord comes back, well, that's going to be a physical battle, and 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 we see that, you know, yeah. some of these things that that's going on could be a replay of the Nephilim. Well, I I partly do believe it also, gentlemen, because the Bible has a lot of repetition amongst the stories. You know, I noticed a pattern just the other day of how many. How many women were barren, and then they bore great men of God? Uh, even even um, even John the Baptist's mother was barren uh, for most of her life, I think, just as Abraham and Sarah could not have children. And uh, on and on these uh, correlations go. And of course, you know, Mary was a virgin still, so she didn't have a chance to see if she was barren. <laughs> But, uh, so these kind of things, there's stories and patterns that repeat themselves, too, uh, such as, uh, I also noticed that, um, uh, not only did Abraham go unto Hagar, his handmaid, but his son Isaac later, I believe, went unto his handmaid to, to have a child, and it's like he made the same mistake his dad made, you know, and, uh, so these kind of things they continue these patterns and the older serving the younger. And so I wouldn't be surprised at all to see that. And I'm hoping that I'm not here to see that. I don't like to see giants really, but if I am, maybe I'll have victory over them uh, through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what kind of connection can we make with the UFOs? Because everybody's believing in UFOs very common now. Do you think that the Antichrist is going to use some kind of a false flag UFO or 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 a false miracle UFOs to to introduce these Nephilim? Yeah, Mike, go ahead and take that one. Well, you know, the, there's a couple of connections there. Uh, as we outlined in the book, um, there's a great deception that's going on. And even though a lot of people believe uh, in UFOs, what they think they are, uh, most what most people think they are is not accurate. Um, years ago, Eric Von Daniken wrote a book called Chariots of the Gods in which he called those uh, UFOs uh, our sky brothers, the, those that had seeded life long ago on this planet, were coming back to check on us and see, you know, what was going on. These are not friendly. They're they're not of God. Uh, they're not, um, you know, they're not spiritually good. Uh, they're right. not a a doorway into greater understanding. And that's how most people see this. Um, I can remember when I encountered part of that Heaven's Gate group uh, when they held a meeting at Port Allen down uh, just across uh, the, the river from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And uh, they rent a room the Holiday Inn and were telling people how they were going to take them in a UFO to a higher spiritual plane. And I, re- I remember questioning them about it and actually debating one of those men one-on-one afterwards uh, about the validity of what they were saying that every people seem to just be gullible when it comes to this subject. Uh, our book puts forth the premise that these are not friendly, and they're not from God, and they're not holy, but they're actually evil. And uh, what they're doing is they're acclimating the population for a day when the Antichrist is going to make his appearance. Now, even though the Bible doesn't say this outright, there's a real possibility. I mean, if you were gonna, if you were gonna become a world leader, if you were to make your appearance in a UFO, and mm-hmm. you could perform lying signs and wonders, even calling down fire from heaven, uh, that'll be part of what the false prophet does. And by the way, that's a that's a very specific thing that he's going to do that has meaning for Israel when they see that. But yeah. the world is going to wonder after the beast the Bible says, 
and they'll think, and who is able to make war with him? He's, he's going to be powerful. Uh, he's going to capture the imagination of the world. And what we're looking at here is an acclamation to the world's population and, and a propaganda campaign carried on by the adversary himself to fool people into who, who really is uh, the good guy and who is not. And, uh, yeah. uh, and so we see a connection there between uh, the UFOs and, um, uh, and, and what's going to be happening with regard to the Antichrist. And uh, all of that is working uh, for his deception. And by the way, most people are going to fall for that deception. Uh, the good thing is there's a promise uh, that's put over there that, that uh, uh, is recorded in Thessalonians that we're not appointed under the Lord's day of wrath. And so fortunately, yeah. the members of the body of Christ are going to be called out of here before God allows all of those things to begin to take place. Um, and there's a reason for that. Um, but if, if someone's not saved and, and the Lord raptures his church out... Um, they're 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 going to go into one of the most horrendous times uh, the world has ever seen, and the cloak is going to be pulled off of evil, and people are going to see the zenith of evil that's going to result in the Lord coming back and executing His day of wrath on the earth, and it's going to be a horrific time. So so we do see, and just to, to wrap up that answer is uh, we, we do see a connection between the activity of UFOs today and what's going to be happening in the future, which I would add, that's one of the reasons why you don't get any more authoritative than what's going on now. In other words, someone could say to us, what in the world makes you guys think that you're qualified to even talk about UFOs? Well, we're as qualified as anybody else considering there are no UFO occupants doing radio programs. So our our basis and the foundation for our understanding of this comes out of the Scripture. And in our understanding, you don't get any more authoritative than the Word of God. Okay. Now, there are some counterfeit wisdoms out there. They sound good, and, and they're, they're appealing in many ways to folks who are ripe for deception. Uh, but it is only that. Uh, it is a deception. And it's uh, it's it's the the seeds are being planted now. Um, people don't like to hear that maybe these are not friendly. Uh, they don't like that, and so people are are, are they're they're going to run to this with open arms. They'll wind up taking the mark of the beast, and uh, the and they're going to believe this guy is God. In fact, that's what Paul talks about in Thessalonians that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, uh, and they're going to believe that. And, and that's an unfortunate thing. We're hoping our book is not only going to change their understanding of that, but the last chapter is actually dedicated to the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, to give people an opportunity uh, to receive him as their all-sufficient Savior. And that's that's the first step that anyone's going to have to take in order to avoid this deception. Well, that's well said right there. Uh, if. if we could get saved now, folks, if every one of you who aren't saved would turn your life over to the Lord, you can be part of this uh, bride of Christ who will be called up to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and hopefully we can be found worthy to escape all these things, as the Bible says. That's, that's what we want, is to be able to escape. So, right. My wife is going to ask you a question, and I can't quite make it out. Hold on, because i got a headset on. Uh, hold on just a minute, gentlemen. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I think we covered that last time but, uh, about the seeing of the UFOs, but we only got about five or six minutes at this point. But I just wanted to say, too, the Heaven's Gate thing that you had mentioned and you had debated with one of their members, but boy, wasn't that another great deception and a trick of the devil um, to actually, well, it's like the Jim Jones thing. When when people come and they they get too close to being uh, a God-like uh, personality, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, where they think they're a God, basically, or, or some kind of representative of God, then 
this is how it ends a lot of times. It ends in death, you know, and I thought about that in the first hour. The wages of sin are death, and uh, it's all tied up. It's tied up, man. It's a connection there. The devil has come to steal and kill and destroy, and and he's going to use whatever means he can, gentlemen. And so... You've even talked in your book a little bit about the satanic plan of evil and the policy of evil. Uh, We've only got about four or five minutes, so I don't know if we even have time to go into that, but um, how does that play into Well, let let me just jump in and say a quick word about that. If if folks look at the book, they'll see some things outlined there. The, The satanic plan of evil is different from the satanic policy of evil, and I'll explain those in a nutshell. The plan of evil is outlined in Isaiah 14 in those five I wills that Satan uttered where he said, I will ascend above the stars of God, you know, I'll put my throne up. He's got four I wills which are given to you in order that tells him the steps that he is going to take. And the last I will is what he, it's the goal. That's the plan of evil. And that is to be like the Most High. And uh, we may mention this the last time, but that 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 title, the Most High, is actually defined for you over in the book of Genesis, where Abraham meets with Melchizedek, and twice over there that title is defined as the possessor of heaven and earth. Well, Satan knows he can't get rid of God. He can't kill God off, but he wants to be the possessor of heaven and earth. And he, and, he, and he attempted to do that when he trafficked his iniquity in the heavenly places, and, 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 and those angels joined his rebellion. And then Adam fell, and he became the prince of this world, as Jesus called him. And, uh, and that was his plan. And now his policy of evil is the things that he is doing on a daily basis to secure his hold on what he has usurped in the heavens and in the earth. And and that's a different thing, and that takes place in a lot of different ways. And you're right, we don't really have time to talk about all of that, but the policy of evil is to blind people to the truth, uh, to keep um, uh, to yeah. keep the Bible really out of the minds of people or to, to darken their understanding. And so I don't want to take up that whole four minutes, but to, but thanks for bringing that up because that's a that's a substantial subject that folks really need to be aware of. Yeah, people are being blinded to the truth uh, more than ever, I think. We, we we need the Lord more than ever, and uh, we need to keep looking for Him and encourage one another, brothers. Whew, good Lord, this has been great. I really appreciate you both for coming on tonight. And uh, I'm going to throw out the websites again, well, right here at the end, AaronJudkins.com or alien-agenda.com, or graceage.org. Graceage.org are the three main sites. Have I covered them pretty well there, gentlemen? Is there any I've left off? Oh, no, you didn't uh, MBI, it. And if, MBI studies, mbistudies.com. That, mbistudies.com. If you don't mind, I can throw out an eight, an eight, uh, a toll-free number. If folks are interested in seconds. calling and getting information, we'll be glad to send them out a catalog. And that number is 888-605-3202. Now, I'll I'll say it again, 888-605-3202. That's toll-free from anywhere in the country, and we'll be glad to answer folks' questions. Okay. Well, it sounds like you gentlemen are very busy and doing the work of the Lord, and that's that's what it's about. We want to get to the other side and hear those. 60 seconds. Amen. Well done, good and faithful servant. So, well, hey, um, we missed we we missed you at our future congress in Dallas. Oh man, I hated to miss that so badly. We've been planning for months to go to that thing, and then uh, my wife's health was just really took a turn for the worse, and uh, she couldn't go, and I I couldn't even leave her to go because her health was just so touch and go at that point. But she's getting physically stronger, I think, now. But, um, yeah, just we couldn't go this time. Man, I missed that. I hated that. But I was so looking forward to it. But it sounded like it went very well from the, the conversation. Ten seconds. 
Yes, it did go good. We had a great attendance and uh, um, upwards of about a thousand people was at the conference and over seventy authors and speakers. And we had a we had a great time. Look for Future Congress three next year there in Dallas, Texas. All right, all right. We'll try to get to that one then. Lord willing. So God bless you, gentlemen. Thank you for coming on. Thanks for having us. Goodbye, and listening audience. Until next time, peace. In Jesus' name. Night. Hey, it's all